So Luke chapter 11, would you stand with me as we begin reading this morning at verse 9. Luke 11, verse 9. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Let's pray once again together. Father, our prayer is please open this passage of Scripture to our hearts, perhaps in a new way this morning. Let us not go away the same as we came. Help us to understand the urgency of eternity. Thank you for being with us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I mentioned when, uh, I f- when we first started this series on prayer, this is, the, this is the last sermon today on this subject for the moment, but I mentioned that I felt our church is doing well in many, many, many areas. Very grateful for the work that we see going on, for the work of God in the hearts of people, but that I I really feel like prayer is one of the areas that we are weak in as a church, as a congregation. And uh, I, I really believe that the Holy Spirit would challenge us over time to make sure that that changes both individually as well as when we're together. We need to pray with and for each other, and we need to pray for our community, beloved. And so as we come to the end of this series, I just pray that you will have seen things here that will encourage your heart in prayer. We've looked at verses 5 through 13. As we've been looking at that, we said that it appeared that, that sometimes it appears that God is reluctant to answer. Sometimes the answers aren't coming as fast as we think they should When answers are delayed, it appears as though God is apathetic or on vacation or somehow just not interested or maybe he did, he answered people in the Bible but not anymore. We get disillusioned. Our natural reaction is to give up. And in light of that, Jesus, knowing that this would happen, is instructing us here how to react. And he gives two examples in these two parables, verses 5 through Eight, he's actually saying persist in prayer. Verses 9 through 13, he's asking us to expect, to pray expectantly, to pray with the expectation of an answer. Now the key, the key to how we pray expectantly is this. It's this. We have to see God as Father. We have to understand God as Father. And I'll show you that as we go along today, but just just kind of mark down to uh, to understand how to pray expectantly. We have to view God as Father. If we view God as many have been taught, including probably many of us who are here this morning, to view God as a kind of magic dispenser machine and and you put your money in and out comes the answer, if we view God that way, we are doomed to be disappointed. Because that's not who God is. God is not our servant. We are his servants. Many have isolated the ask, seek, and not portion of this passage. And they've said, see, there there you have it. There it is. All you got to do is ask. And God is obligated to respond. God is obligated to give you what you want. And if it doesn't happen, inevitably you will be told, well, you just didn't have enough faith. It's your fault. This is the view of God that many of us have had. God was willing, you didn't believe. This is the God 
as Santa Claus' approach to prayer. It's not biblical. It does irreparable damage to verses 8 and 9 to rip them out of context like that and leave behind ragged edges because we've pulled it from its context. The ask, seek, and knock, that is the how of prayer, is defined by verses 1 through 4, which tells us the what of prayer. And you remember, as we've looked at that, the what of prayer is that it's, number one, it's God-centered, not me-centered. It's intended to align me with God's will, not align God with my will. That would be tragic, believe me. We saw also that it is, that it is need-driven as opposed to luxury-driven or desire-driven. And we have seen that it is spiritually prioritized as opposed to physically prioritized. It's not that God doesn't care about the physical needs. He absolutely does. But five out of the six requests in the Lord's Prayer, or the, really the disciples' prayer here, are, are around spiritual needs. So, so ask, seek, and knock, explain how to pray that kind of prayer, not my Christmas list. This is a context here, do you see? And this is what the context is telling us. This is not depicting God as the magic you know, genie in the sky who's just granting our wishes carte blanche if we just have enough faith. Expectant prayer views God as Father. Jesus' model prayer, how does it begin? Our Father. In verses 11 through 13, we're going to see that God, that God uses the concept, Jesus uses the concept of, further, of Father to further explain how this all works. So seeing God as Father, seeing God as Father is the key to this passage. Now the implications quickly fall out of this. A, a good father loves to do for his children, Right? A lot of good fathers here, and you love to do for your children. So you give them every request that they ever ask for, right? I don't think so. A good father is constantly filtering those requests through his greater wisdom, right? A loving father often does not give exactly what is requested because he sees danger that the child does not see, and he sees opportunity that the child does not see. And so when your two-year-old two comes along and asks for, <clears throat> for the butcher knife to play with, what do you do? You say no, right? And when your 16-year-old comes along and wants to marry the first guy that paid any attention to her, what do you say? At least wait, right? Your greater wisdom is brought to bear on the situation because you are a Good father. Parents see danger where children don't see it. Parents see opportunity where children do not see it. That simple premise will greatly inform your expectations in prayer, beloved. You have a loving father who knows more than you do. And you need to rejoice in that. And you need to expect on the basis of that. We're not petitioning a servant. We're petitioning a father. And so Tim Keller says it beautifully when he says this. He says, your father gives you. Your father gives you what you would have asked if you knew everything that he knows. Your father gives you everything that you would have asked if you knew everything that he knows. Thank God for that. But while we pay lip service to God as Father, here's my real concern. I could go around the room this morning and you'd all say, sure, God's my Father. I understand that God is my Father, and I love it that God is my Father, but the truth is we don't really many times believe it. We don't act like that's the case. We whine, we complain, we waver, we worry. We go back and forth. We insist on our own way. We live messy lives, <laughs> beloved, because we're not trusting our Father. So how can we change? Three things in this passage challenge us with 
to change our attitude toward God as Father with regard to prayer? Number one, expect an answer. Expect an answer. Verse 10. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. That's a great verse, is it not? It's a great verse. But we already know that in the larger context of the Bible as a whole, there are qualifiers, right? We've seen some of them. Just to remind you of a couple of them, Psalm 119, verse 67 tells me, what, if I cherish iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I can't come with unconfessed sin and expect that God's even going to listen to my request. James 4, 3 tells me that if I pray for something in order to, to spend it on my own passions, in other words, it's just selfishness on my part, the Lord doesn't hear. Our prayers must align with Jesus' example, which confesses sin and which prays a God-centered prayer rather than a me-centered prayer. But if our heart is pure, beloved, we can pray expectantly. Verse 9 is telling us, I want you to pray persistently, and verse 10 tells us why we should pray persistently. Why should we pray persistently? Because an answer is coming. In fact, here's the, really the first thing I want you to really get your arms around. Notice in verse 9, notice in verse 9, all three of those commands are present tense. Ask, seek, and knock. And present tense in the Greek language means continuous action. This is not a, a point in time, I have this big thing over here that I really want, so I'm just going to knock down the gates of heaven and I'm going to get that thing. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with that approach, but that's not what this verse is teaching. This verse is teaching, I want you to be asking, seeking, and knocking all the time. This is to be a lifestyle this is who you are as a Christian. You are dependent on a heavenly Father. So be always asking, seeking, and knocking. And then look at verse 10. Two out of the three promises are present tense. For everyone who is always asking, receives. Literally, present tense is now constantly receiving. And the one who seeks is always finding. The only one that's future tense is the last one. To the one who knocks, it will be opened. Here's what I take away from this verse. As I pray, God is already answering. I may not see the answer right now. I may not understand what he's doing. I may not get it at all. But in the background, God is already answering. Now the Ultimate answer may be out there somewhere in the future, but he's already at work. In some ways, think of it this way. In some ways, prayer is a little bit like an iceberg, right? You see the top 10% of the iceberg. That's all you see. 90% of it is under water. And prayer is like that. We pray, nothing happens. We don't see anything. Sometimes for a few minutes, sometimes for a few hours, sometimes for a few days, weeks, months, even years, Right? But here's what this verse is assuring me. It's assuring me that when I finally do see the answer, then I'm going to be able to look back and I'm going to say, oh, I see that there were little pieces of this being put together all the time. God was at work the whole time. I, I just didn't understand how that little piece was going to fit in. Didn't even see that it related to this answer. But now... As I look back on it, I see that. You want, uh, let me tell you one of the things. I try and give you the bad examples in my life because there's a lot of them. Allow me a good one this morning. Okay, One of the things that Patty and I do regularly now is when we're praying for something that we're, maybe we've been praying for for years in some cases, we've begun to make it a habit to, to, be thank, to thank God for what he's already doing that we're, that we're not seeing yet that's leading to the answer that's going to come one of these days. There's no better way to pray expectantly than that. 
Make your request, but be thanking God for what he's already doing that you just don't see. That's praying expectantly in the face of silence, of reluctance, apparent reluctance. Now, why don't we expect answers? Probably the number one reason is because we've prayed it didn't happen when we thought it ought to happen, and so we've just given up, right? And we... A few weeks ago, we talked about that. If, if you didn't hear that sermon, you need to go back and listen to why there is, the apparent, there, there is the appearance of apparent reluctance on the part of God that's not really reluctance. But I think there's another reason we don't expect answers sometimes. We don't think we deserve it. And guess what? We don't. If prayer was answered based on who deserved it, no prayer would ever get answered, beloved. We're in the same boat. We don't deserve an answer to prayer at our best. You can't earn God's answer to prayer. He's so far above us and so far beyond who we are that there's no possible way that we could deserve his answer. But look, look what God tells us in Hebrews. Turn with me to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Toward the end of the New Testament, uh, Get to Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, and you're getting close. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4, look at verse 15. Hebrews 4, verse 15. Here's what the writer says. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin, let us then with confidence draw near the throne of grace. I like the old King James word, boldly. Let's come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Come expectantly to the throne of grace. Come knowing there's going to be an answer to the throne of grace, to the very presence of God. But why? Because I'm good? No, 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 no. Go back to verse 15. Not because I'm good, but because I'm coming with what? A high priest, a representative, a mediator who's been where I am and who has now saved me. And on the basis of his salvation, I come to the throne of grace with Christ. Listen, you should always come boldly, but you should never think you're coming alone to the throne of grace to come boldly. You'd be, you'd be incinerated in a moment because our Lord is a consuming fire is what the Bible says. But when you come with Christ, when you have a Savior in Him, and when you're coming with Him, you can come boldly. Jesus represents us to the Father. And the Father doesn't answer because we deserve it. He answers because He deserves it. Beloved, we're expectantly, we pray expectantly in Christ. No other way. We're like the 17-year-old girl I read about not too long ago. She's seeking her first job. Applied at a restaurant, and she knew that her uncle knew the owner, so she cleverly came to her uncle and said, can I use you as a reference? Naturally, he said, of course. He was happy to help her, but he was surprised a few days later when he got a call that said, uh, could, you, could you meet me this afternoon at the restaurant? He said, well, yeah, I can meet you there, but why? And she said, well, the manager has called me in for an interview and she told me to bring my references. <laughs> she didn't quite understand the principle yet, right? All he wanted was names and addresses and phone numbers, bring my references. I love her idea. Bring your reference. When you come to the throne of grace, beloved, bring your reference. You're not, you're not coming because you deserve it. You're not expecting because you're des you deserve it. You're not asking because you deserve it. You're coming and you're asking and you're expecting because he deserves it. That's the only reason we can come boldly to the throne of God because of what he's done. We come with great expectations because the blood of Christ compels the answer from the Father. Come expectantly. Expect an answer. Secondly, 
expect a good answer. Expect a good answer. We're back in Luke 11. Expect a good answer. Now here's the kicker. The answer you get may not look like what you think, right? It may not. Why? Because the answer you get is going to be a good answer. You say, but wait a minute. What I was asking for was good. So you think. So we all think, right? A little two-year-old asking for a butcher knife thinks he's asking for a good thing. We don't come to Christ and ask for things we don't think are a good thing. But here's the deal, beloved. Here's, here's the deal. See, we don't know all the circumstances, but God does. We don't know what our heart truly needs, see, but God does. We don't know what other people around us who are watching us, who are part of our family, who are part of those that we're ministering to, we don't know what they need, but God does. We don't know what might be of the hundred different paths we might go down here, but God does. We don't know the end from the beginning, but God does. And so do you see what happens when we pray? God takes all of those things into account and he crafts an absolutely perfect answer. Absolutely perfect. There's no imperfection in God, is there? What have we said before? If you're going to pray effectively, you need to know two things. You need to know that God is always good, never anything but good, never can do anything that's not good. And secondly, you need to know that whatever it appears, he is not reluctant. God crafts the good answer that we would have asked if we know everything that he knows. So while it may not look exactly, sometimes, sometimes it may, it'll look exactly like what we asked for. That's always encouraging, right? Sometimes we actually get it right. But oftentimes it doesn't. But what we know is that God will always give us what we need. Not what we want, but always what we need. Now that's, that's what he's getting at in verses 11 and 12. Okay, that's what he's teaching in verses 11 and 12. So let's look there, verse 11. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Matthew chapter 7, verse 9, which is the parallel account to this, says this, or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Now, in order to understand what he's saying here, you have to understand that fish, eggs, and bread were common foods in Palestine, right? You also have to understand that a serpent might sometimes look like a fish. A coiled up scorpion might sometimes look like an egg. A stone might sometimes look like a loaf of bread. So what Jesus is saying here is, here comes your little two-year-old toddler along and he, and, and, he sees, and he sees there a stone that looks like a piece of bread and he says, Dad, can I have some bread? What are you going to do? You're going you, you're gonna to give him the stone? Of, of course not. You're not going to play tricks on your child. And God doesn't play tricks on his children either. I was walking in a homeless section of San Francisco one night when I was much younger. A friend and I were walking along and we, we, we saw a young man come along and he was digging in a, in, a, in a bag and we saw him pull out some money. We thought, oh, this guy's great. This guy's going to give out some money. And instead of handing it to somebody, he, he had a glove on his hand. He tossed the money out to the to, to the, one of the homeless people who was there. And immediately the guy began to scream, bloody murder. The coins had been heated. They were hot. It was a practical joke. God doesn't play jokes on his children, beloved. Doesn't. So when you ask for something and you don't get it, that's not God playing a practical joke on you. That's God answering in the way that he knows is absolutely going to be the best thing. God doesn't give his children scorpions. If his son happens to see a scorpion curled up in the corner and says, Dad, can I please have that egg? He doesn't give that to his child. He sees danger that the child doesn't see. And he sees opportunity that the child does not see and he answers according to his greater wisdom and goodness. 
That's God. For everyone who asks, receives, verse 10, the one who seeks, finds, to the one who knocks, it shall be opened. You, you may have noticed the prosperity gospel guys love that verse. Taken out of context, it makes no qualifications. And that's what they do with it. They read it and they claim, hey, you want a Maserati? Just ask for it. And then believe. Believe. You know, you come to church the next week and say, hey, Pastor Benny, I, I, I didn't get my car. What's he going to say to you? Sorry, you didn't believe. If you'd had enough faith, you'd get your car. That's how those charlatans work. But that's not at all what Jesus means. He is urging us to persist in prayer. He's urging us to expect an answer, but expect an answer in keeping with the Father's greater goodness, love, and wisdom. Do you see why I say understanding God as Father is the key to this passage? That's the whole point of these illustrations. God would never give to his children something that would be bad, even though we ask for bad things. We don't do it knowingly, of course. We just don't know what we're asking. God's greatest gift is that he gives us what we need rather than what we want one of his greatest gifts. We're like the children, you know, that are with mom when she comes to the checkout counter. Mom, I need 10 boxes of Dove bars, right? Mom loves her child, so she gives him the 10 boxes of Dove bars, right? Of course not. Because she loves the child, she doesn't give the 10 boxes of Dove bars. The way God is, beloved, our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father has the same filter that parents do. Parents filter requests, God filters requests. And that's why we must see God as Father when we come to Him in prayer. That's the reason I think Jesus asked Him to pray to us, ask us to pray to Him as Father, in the recognition that He's going to filter that request. So when the answer isn't what we asked for, we know it's actually better. Okay, get your arms around what I just said. God either gives us what we ask for or something better. That's a win-win, right? Can't lose with that kind of deal. So pray expectantly. Calvin says it this way, John Calvin. He said, God does not answer our prayers as we pray them, but as we would pray them if we were wiser. This is the, that's the whole point of Romans chapter 8, turn there. Romans chapter 8. This is a wonderful passage. Some of you, I know we've been in Bible studies or different things and looked at it probably on Sunday mornings as well, but this is a great place to review it. Romans 8, beginning in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us with our weaknesses. <laughs> We need a lot of help. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself, listen to this, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You come to God in prayer and you really mean it. Here's what gets activated in the background. The Holy Spirit is praying for you with an urgency that you could never attach to it. I, this is beyond my comprehension. The Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, but that's not the end. Verse 27, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of the Father. The Holy Spirit doesn't pray for you according to your will. He prays for you according to the will of the Father. That is a tremendous statement. What that's saying is that your request is going through the Holy Spirit filter. And he retrofits our requests to turn them into what they would be if we were wiser. So that they correspond to the will of the Father. Don't ever hesitate to come to God. Make your 
make your request the best way you know how to make it, beloved. But then expect an answer that's going to be in accordance with what the Holy Spirit is praying for you at the same time. Here's an example, Genesis 37. Go back to Genesis. And then kind of hold your place in Genesis for a little bit and in Luke. We'll be in and out of those. Genesis 37. Let me give you an example of this. Jacob had a dysfunctional family. Remember Jacob, the patriarch? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He had a dysfunctional family. Too many wives, too many kids, too much favoritism. Kind of summarizes his family. And in Genesis 37, verse 4, that's what we read. His favorite was Joseph. As you know, he loved Joseph best because Joseph was the first son of his favorite wife. Genesis 37, 4, but when Joseph's brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, we know that Joseph loved the Lord, right? We know that. As we follow his life, it's clear that from the day one, he loved his wife, he loved his, li- he loved his Lord. And so we can imagine that he prayed for peace in this house. We're not actually told that, but we imagine that he prayed for peace. Did God answer that prayer? Absolutely. But not in any way that we would have ever expected it to be answered. Joseph didn't just wake up one morning and all of a sudden, hey, everybody loved him. That's what he would have liked. That would have been nice. Instead, Joseph woke up one morning. His father sent him out to find his brothers, and his brothers tried to kill him. And then when that didn't work, they sold him into slavery in Egypt. And you remember the story. Later on, the brothers were in trouble many years later because there was famine in their land. And so they came to Egypt where they knew that there was food that had been stored up. What they didn't know was that their brother Joseph was the brains behind the whole idea and running everything in Egypt by that time. And so when they showed up, Joseph finally revealed himself to them after some shenanigans to see if they were really repentant. And you get to Genesis 45, verse 2. Genesis 45, verse 2. Listen. And he, that's Joseph, he wept aloud. The brothers who had hated him, the brothers who had sold him into slavery, as he's revealing himself to them now, he wept aloud. So even the Egyptians heard it, even though they were in a separate room, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. This has always been my, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. How can you not like this? Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they, where they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near me, please. And they came near. Prayer answered a lot of years later after going through hell to get there. Is that the way you would have answered Joseph's prayer for harmony? Me neither. God's ways are not our ways, right? No, they're not, because his ways are always best. God's ways are always good. God's ways are always right. God's ways are always perfect. You must believe that. You must pray expectantly. God's gonna do what's right. Our Father gives us what we would have asked if we knew everything that he knows. Expect good answers. Now, don't lose your place in Genesis, but back in Luke for just a moment. Third point here, expect an answer, expect a good answer, expect a divine answer, expect a divine answer. Back in Luke 11, verse 13, if you then who are evil know how to get good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Matthew's account says, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good good things to those who ask of Him? This is what what we would call an argument from the lesser to the greater. It was a concept that was used often in Jesus' time. What Jesus is saying is, if if those of you who are less than perfect 
still protect and give good gifts to your children, how much more is your absolutely perfect Heavenly Father going to give good gifts to you? And here's the kicker. The best gift of all is Himself. The Holy Spirit. What Jesus is saying is you get serious about what you're asking for, I'm not only going to give you the gift, I'm going to give you the giver. You're not just going to have the blessing, you're going to have the blesser. And that's a wonderful promise. Because see, what we don't, what we don't see and what we don't understand is this. We don't understand that that which our heart desires, which comes out from us in terms of physical or sometimes even spiritual things, good things, our heart desires this, but we don't recognize that deep down what this really expresses is the deepest desire of the human heart, which is the desire for God. That's what we need the most. That's what we ultimately desire the most because that's the way he made us, beloved. Augustine said it, you, we've all been created with, a, with essentially a blank spot in our heart that will not be filled until it's filled with God. And God is saying, that's what I will do for you. The only thing that can ultimately fulfill our heart's desire is not something, it's someone. And that someone is God himself. Psalm 37, verse 4. It's a verse that, don't, don't turn out, just read it, but you're familiar with the verse. You've heard it misinterpreted hundreds of times. Psalm 37, verse 4 says, Trust or delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I grew up on that verse. I was told, just delight yourself in God, and whatever you want over here, he'll give you. That's not what the verse is saying. The verse is saying, delight yourself in God, and he will give you God. Because that's the thing you desire. That's what that verse is saying. Saying, seek God and you will find him. That's what it's saying. Delight in God and you will find God. That's what it's saying. That's what it's promising because that's the thing you really need. That's what you really, that's what will give true meaning to your life. That's what will give purpose to your life. You remember Jacob's life. We'll get back to Jacob for just a moment. Married two women. Part of his problem, right? Married Leah and then he married Rachel. He loved Rachel. He didn't love Leah. He got fooled. Long story, but he got fooled. So Leah had children and Rachel didn't. Rachel was barren. So Leah saw children as a way to win the heart of her husband. This was her greatest desire, Genesis 29. You have to back up just a little bit in Genesis. Genesis 29. And we see how this plays out. Genesis 29, beginning in verse 32. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, which means, see, a son. She's sending a message to Jacob, see, a son. I've given you what Rachel can't give you, see, a son. Can I win your heart? For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. This is, her, this is the desire of her heart. Verse 33, didn't happen, didn't happen, disappointed. So she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard me and I'm hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon, heard. I've been heard. So surely the Lord will let my husband love me now. Didn't happen. So verse 34, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband is, will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi, attached. <laughs> surely my husband will want to attach to me now. Didn't happen. Her hopes were dashed until she finally got the message. Verse 35. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah, which means praise or the Lord be praised. And then she ceased bearing she learned what the Lord wants all of us to know, beloved, that what we need is God, and God is available, and he gives himself to those who will ask. He wants us to desire him above all, 
And that's exactly what Leah got. And let me tell you how powerful she got this. Judah, that last son, the one where her heart had finally turned toward God, Judah became the lineage through which Jesus Christ the Messiah came. He didn't come through the favored wife, Rachel. He didn't come through the favored son, Joseph. He came through the unloved, unwanted, rejected wife, Leah. And she came to the point of realizing, hey, I want God more than I want my husband's love. That's quite a point to come to, isn't it? God gave her himself in a powerful way. So how do we finish this series on prayer? Some of us see prayer as Aladdin's lamp. I have to tell you, I've read a lot of guys on prayer, some of the most wonderful preachers in the world, and a lot of them, I think, get this wrong. We see it as Aladdin's lamp, but imagine putting that power into the hands of your five-year-old. We forget who we are, and we forget who God is. You give your five-year-old Aladdin's lamp and say, hey, rub it, and you get three wishes, whatever you want. doesn't matter if it's good or bad, selfish or not, smart or stupid, you get it. With that scenario, all we know for sure is that disaster is just around the corner, right? Just as surely as we live. But beloved, that's the kind of power prayer has. It does. But fortunately, real, genuine, heartfelt prayer is addressed to a great God who has a safety valve on, a foolishness filter that it all goes through because we're toddlers. He sees the dangers we don't see. He sees the opportunities we don't see, and he answers in accordance with those things. If prayer were Aladdin's lamp without a filter, we'd all be dead. We would have killed ourselves long ago. Pastor that I knew told about his daughter, Jackie. Jackie was close friends in high school with a young man named Matt. And uh, they ended up in a high school group together. They ended up in a singing group together. Matt was playing, I think, drums uh, in the band that was back up to the one that Jackie sang for. So they began to talk about going to college together. They became very close. Matt was diagnosed with lymphatic cancer during their senior year in high school. And Jackie says this. She said, I had great faith that God would heal Matt. He had such a passion to be a pastor, teaching others. I knew God wouldn't take his life because Matt could make such a difference in this world. I ain't got off. God is obligated to me because we're doing the right things here. She prayed with great faith, but Matt died. Sent Jackie into a turmoil. Couldn't figure out why God hadn't answered her prayer. She said, initially, I blamed God. Later, I blamed myself because I thought I didn't pray hard enough, or maybe I accidentally missed praying for one day. Is any of this sounding familiar? After graduation, Jackie went to a Christian college. She began to release the pain. She gradually began to give it over to the Lord, the grief that was locked inside of her. She said, once I actually voiced my suffering, the healing began, and I experienced God's love again. She thought back on it, and she realized, you know what, Matt, Matt was trying to prepare us. M Matt, Matt had loved God and treasured his relationship with God more than temporary life on earth. And she realized from some of the statements he had made that that's what had happened. And then she realized, you know what? We were praying for God to give Matt life, and he did. He answered yes. It's just that he gave him life in heaven instead of life on earth. How much better is that? In time, she met another young man named Michael also a Bible teacher, studying to be, also played in the band that she sang for. Eventually, the two of them got married. But beloved, the question is, why Mike and not Matthew? 
And the only answer is God knows. But that's the point. God knows. He's the only one that needs to know. Our job is to be faithful. Our job is to trust him. Trust him. He'll give you what you would ask if you knew as much as he knows. Let's be people of prayer. Father, we thank you for this. I just thank you for this series, Lord. It's changed my life. And I pray that it would change all of our lives. I pray that more than anything, rather than worrying about the details of how or what or whatever else, that it would encourage us just to be in touch with you, to be in communication with you, and then at the same time to be trusting you, to realize prayer is not about aligning you with my will, but it's about aligning me with your will. What a precious place to be. What a precious way to look at our relationship with you. That way, Lord, when we get it right and we see you answering our prayers just the way we ask them, we can rejoice. And when we see you answering our prayers differently than we ask, we can rejoice because we got something better. It didn't look better in the short term, but it's much better somehow in the long term. You would never give us stones or scorpions or serpents. Never. That would never happen. So we can trust you. Help us to trust you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.